Hello everyone. Uh, it says I'm live, so I guess I must be. I've been trying to get the radio set up here. It's on 40 meters. I thought we'd try uh, seeing if we could, you know, get at least one or two live radio calls while we're doing that. Um, it's uh, <laughs> very busy on 40 meters tonight. Not quite so busy on 20. We, we may try both and see what we can do with that. So welcome to everybody from Dave Kassler, uh, KE0OG here in Ridgeway, Colorado. And we're starting our Thursday evening live stream at 645 p.m. Mountain uh, Standard Time, Mountain Standard Time. Um, quite a few things going on. Uh, let's just start with uh, what we have in the um, in the comments and, and uh, let a few people join. And as more people join, um, I've got a couple things to, uh, to show. Uh, let's see. Jason says, welcome to Augie Special. Optical Man Jeff, KE0KRO. Hi Dave and all Augies from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where it's 26 degrees in snow. It's 38 here. Uh, somewhat warm day. Still have snow in the backyard though. Um, let's see. Uh, Pete Dayton's channel, Augies from South Florida, where it's 69. Clear skies. Half moon with Jupiter uh, beside K. Oh, for IRD, Pete Dayton. Uh, Glenn Martin, hello from far west Missouri area. 34 degrees, 29%. Relative humidity from N0 QFT. Chuck Schreiber, good evening, Dave. And all Uggies N5 KVO from the hill country of South Texas. Currently 63. Um, and I have turned off monetization entirely for this video. So we'll see. Let me know if you see ads. Uh, you shouldn't. Okay, Ralph Leland. Hi Dave and everyone. K4TA in Fork Union, Virginia. 48 here and 68% relative humidity. KC8ARO. Hello from Michigan. Lefty, good evening. Augie's from Davenport, Iowa. 30 degrees. Expecting snow after midnight. John Ward. Hello from W3OJ. 46 degrees in Maryland. And Kang says hello. KK4GMR. Uh, Steve Jair. Hi Dave from Orlando, Florida. I guess if I put some glasses on I could actually see this. Um, Steve Jair. Hi Dave from Orlando. Uh, I think the Orlando Hamvention is coming up at some point here. Um, Charles Layton. Hello fellow Augie from Chuck, AA5KR. Steve Kleisey, is that an Aladdin lamp in the background? It is, but not that one. The Aladdin lamp is oops, over there. Up there. You see it right next to the KE0OG sign. That is an Aladdin lamp with the high altitude extender on top of it. I have a new um, I have a new um, burner for it or the uh, what do they call it? It's um, mantle. It's a mantle. And uh, I also have some pure kerosene. They're supposed to burn pure kerosene, not lamp oil. That may have been the trouble I had uh, earlier with that. Um, Steve Jair, W2SCG, Hell So. Um, Robert Varner, hello from KC2DEL in New Jersey. Doug Dry, hi Doug. Good evening everybody from Kennesaw, Georgia. Hugo Quintana, hello from Hugo, KK7DTF in Yuma, Arizona, where it's probably... A little warmer there than it is here. I did not make it to Quartz Fest. It just did not happen this year. Uh, Buddy Brennan, KB5ELV, 
from Erie, Pennsylvania. K2JB Dean Blair. Good evening from uh, West North Carolina, I guess, WNC. Um, K2JB, Dave Nolan. Hello, Dave. Retired from IBM. Dave and I used to work together at the uh, Boulder plant up in uh, Colorado. Says, hello, Dave, from Sun Lakes, Arizona. Now retired from IBM. K0, NNN. Uh, Ed Fry popped in. John Reese says, good morning, Dave, from G4 EIJ Holiday near Perth. Western VK land, 73. What is that strange sound? No, I don't like that. Like I said, 40 meters is jammed. Um, uh, King says, uh, Latin lamps, love them. That mantle will soot up um, in time. Uh, let's see, Trap Spamalot, high from K4TQF, 55 in um, Memphis. King okay. Chip Weekly, W3BEW, good evening, Dave, top of the evening. Tell the other Augies from the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina, hello. And Leo Gustafson says hello, Dave, and all Augies from Albany, Oregon. KK7CLY, Leo, visiting, hope all is well, and, and things are well. Um, some time ago, I obtained from KF7, let's see if I can find his, KF7P. I'm going to switch this over to the screen, I think. Now, I think I have to do it first from there and then I can do it from here. This guy right here makes these entry panels uh, that have the lightning arresters in them and that's N6GR's entry panel and grounding and note that that's uh, my video right there. That's my hand. Um, and he sent me one and I had an electrician come and put it in today. Um, it just wasn't happening. At my rate, there were a couple things such as drilling through the wall of the house and so on and so forth, getting that thing right and at the right point and all that sort of thing. And this way I can bring my cables up to inside the panel. Then they all go into the house and and then this copper sheet here is grounded to a ground right below. And so that's been done and put in. And uh, we will start using it on Friday tomorrow when my assistant comes and we can... Uh, oh, not screen, normal view. There we go. And, and what we're going to do is start running all the cables through that which would be much cleaner, much easier, because every time I go down to the ground rod to attach or detach cables, it's just a tangled mess of undergrowth and stuff like that. So, Also, I want to show you something that uh, my daughter got for me for Christmas. This is a Yeti, not the Stanley. But look what she had put on the side of it. This is my daughter. Um, now, her call sign is, um, see if I can remember it, uh, K, KB, zero UBW, something like that, KB, zero UBW. And she's not active, but she keeps her call sign current. But I thought that was very nice of her to have that done uh, down here. Really appreciate that. Um, let's see, Sean, Cam 6 NFO, just uh, put in a... Uh, Super Chat for $20. Says, hello, Dave and Augie's Worldwide. Beautiful in Sacramento right now. Expecting a soaking this weekend and Monday. Our club just made its first attempt at a 23 centimeter net. That's definitely high up there in frequency. Fun times. 73 to all. Best wishes to all. Thank you, Sean. 
much appreciated. Okay, let's see. Um, I showed you the cup. Yes. And I've got the radio here, and I thought we might try a call or two later, see if anybody could hear. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Trap spam a lot. I think we talked, uh, he says hi all from K4 TQF. Chip Weekly, K3B. EW, good evening, Dave. Top of the evening till the other Augies from the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina. Leo Gustafson, Albany, Oregon. Uh, Neil Marsh, good evening from W7NRM in Mount St. Helens country. Uh, Leo Gustafson got distracted again today, but I must say that Michael at Innovato is very attentive to questions and trying to help. My last go round was changing the connection from wired to my phone Wi-Fi. Well, good. I hope it uh, always says, but it failed. Uh, regarding ham clock. Well, I'm glad there, there is a conversation going on. That is very good. On league and seven A&H. Hello, Dave and Augies. Why are doublet antennas differentiated from dipoles? Aren't they just dipoles fed by ladder line? Is it better than dipoles? The classic definition of a doublet is not a dipole. It's either longer or shorter. Uh, dipole, remember, is, a, is half a wavelength long, half an electrical wavelength long. And in ordinary wire, the velocity factor is usually taken to be about 0.95. So you take a half wavelength uh, at the speed of light, multiply it by 0.95 to make it slightly shorter to take into account that uh, electricity propagates more slowly in wire than it does in free space and that gives you the length of your dipole. Now doublet, common lengths for it are 100 feet long, 150 feet long, and so on. They are at the frequencies we use non-resonant antennas. So you're going to have to use an antenna tuner because your radio wants to see a tuned load. So what happens is the antenna tuner will add in whatever reactants, whether inductive or capacitive, that's required to make the combination of the antenna tuner, the transmission line, and the uh, antenna and its environment resonant. And uh, they're very popular because they're very easy to put up. Uh, they can be used on any band, but beware that you're often putting a lot of reactants. Now, if you've got a, a tank circuit, which is a resonant tank circuit, you've got a capacitance and an inductor that combined are resonant at a certain frequency. But then you separate them by a long transmission line. And so you get very high circulating currents in the coax. And that will cause ohmic losses. So instead of using a 50 ohm cable where your voltage is V over the, you, your, your resistance is V, your, your impedance is V over uh, or E over I, R, E squared over, yeah, you know what I mean, Ohm's law. If you use a higher impedance line, there's higher voltage and lower current. And the amount of heat radiated by the line goes down as the square of the current. Okay, so if you can drop your current by a factor of 10 or so, then what you have is the ability to put a lot of reactive um, circulating currents through and keep the losses low. So think of it as a tuned circuit. You've got some capacitance and inductance in the antenna and feed line, and you've got the complex conjugate of it in the antenna tuner. So capacitive versus inductive or the other way around. And you create a tank circuit that resonates at your frequency. And the circulating currents can be quite high. 
Now, note that the Q in there is affected by the um, by the resistance. More resistance, lower Q. It's fun to play with those things. Okay. Um, some people love their doublets. Wouldn't put up any other kind of antenna. Me, I prefer dipoles because I don't have to worry about tuning them. Um, okay, Neil Mars says, I've been real happy with Innovato and their ham clock gadget. Roz Brown, W0NBG. Hi, Dave from Lakewood, Colorado. Expecting some more snow here tonight. Studying your extra videos daily so I can pass the test before it gets changed this summer. Thanks for all your help. Well, you're certainly welcome. Now, there's a bit of a change on the horizon, and I don't know what this will mean for me, but the ARRL, after many years of competing with Gordon West, has brought Gordon West under their, their wing. And the league will be publishing his three books, which are training guides for... Uh, Tech General and Extra. Now, his books, one thing I really like about his books is they're in full color. Uh, but he tends to kind of teach the test a little bit more than I do. I like to teach the material. Um, so we'll see how that works out. Because in the article in this uh, month's, this coming month's QST, March QST, which is already out, um, they said that his title will be the ARRL International Instructor, uh, which is <laughs> sort of a title they had discussed giving me. But I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. I have a feeling we'll both coexist uh, for quite a while. Uh, Gordon is um, a very energetic and charismatic fellow. Um, I've met him. I don't know that he knows who I am because I'm just one of thousands of people that he's met. He's very outgoing. So we'll see how that works. It's very interesting. Okay, so that's uh, about uh, those dipoles. Let's see. Um, John Ward, a noontime check-in at Goddard Space Flight Center, WA3NAN 146.835 or Echolink. Bill Heiser, hello, and hello, Bill. I don't recall that call sign. Uh, Leo Gustafson says, another week of waiting for the ICOM PW2 to get approved. I hope it does before I spend my tax refund on something else. Oh, <laughs> I know the, the problem. Uh, get an escrow account or something and stick the money in there. Now, understand that the approval process for the FCC works at the speed of government, which is indistinguishable from a complete stop. Um, so, you can keep looking on the FCC website to see when they should have already an FCC ID because that's where all the paperwork will be listed. Let me show you how that works. This is a little TID radio that I am reviewing. And there's been so much happening this week that I have only got it partly reviewed. I tried, this is supposed to be programmable uh, from your phone. And... So far, I haven't made that work. <laughs> not for lack of trying, but I have not made it work yet. So let's go to um, screen. And we'll go to FCC. Let's see. We want to look up FCC ID lookup. Okay. Here's the search right here. Okay. Now, the grantee code. If you look on the back of the radio, go back to the normal view. I've got to take this battery off. They actually stick the ID code 
from the back of the radio in the battery compartment. Okay, this is TID radio, and it says the FCC ID is 2A4FB TD831. Okay, the 2A4FB is a five-digit grantee code. So we'll put that here. Uh, let me get this over here, screen. Okay, we're going to look on the FCC ID search, and we'll go in here and put the grantee code, which in the case of TID radio is five digits long. So it's 2A4FB. And then the product code is what's left. TD831. And then we search. Okay, now here's a whole bunch of stuff that's been filed. Okay, the final action day was just last December. Notice different ways that the same radio has uh, been uh, expected to perform. Um, Let's just take one of these. We'll go into the detail, and uh, they warn us that uh, you know we could be doing anything. And then these are all the various things. What I like to look at is, for example, the internal photos, and they show what's inside the case, and uh, what the photos are, the different circuit boards, and everything like that. And notice they're pointing out their Bluetooth antenna. Because that's the big thing about this radio is it's Bluetooth. So they've got all kinds of stuff that just goes on forever. Um, now we can go back a screen. and Well, no, we'll close that screen that opened up. Um, we've got a test report. Okay, and notice that this is from a lab. And... Um, this lab, the applicant, uh, this is the company, TID, Huangzhou TID Electronic Technology. Okay, and it's their group. Oh, excuse me. I'll get that. Okay. Um, and there is a company here that does these. And applicant address, manufacturer address, factory address, project designation, and so on and so forth. And they've got this um, signed attestation of, in other words, they're asserting, they're not proving, but they're asserting that this stuff uh, works, okay? And the test methodology, and here's the test facility, okay? Attestation of Global Compliance, Shenzhen Company Limited. This is the company doing the testing, okay? And all the FCC has to work with is the paperwork that it is given, okay? And um, I don't believe... <laughs> If you have been following the news recently, you'll know that the Boeing company has been designated by the FAA to inspect itself. And there is supposedly a group of people who are paid by Boeing, but actually functionally work for the FAA. And we see how well that's worked out. So there was a lot of talk about that after the first two crashes of the 737 MAX. And now that we've had the incident with the door coming off, turns out that Alaskan Airline asserts that the bolts were never put in. The, the way the door works, it snaps into place, and then you put some bolts in to keep it there. So what happened, according to Alaska Airlines, is the bolts were never put in, and as the airplane was used, they were about three months into this, the door snapped up and out. And um, fortunately, they found the door, 
and they looked at it and there was paint on the holes and everything and they claimed that uh, the bolts were never put in because there's no scratches on the paint from tightening the bolts. So there's an example of the government de delegating to somebody it's regulating the ability to regulate themselves. And uh, that's going to go wrong from time to time. Now, suppose that the FAA had actually inspected every plane. Is there a chance things still could have gone wrong? Of course. So we will never know. And since we have such a small sample of these things, we don't know. But the FCC has a history of delegating. It regulates the amateur radio service and it gives the amateur radio service the ability to test, examine, certify, all that sort of thing. And the only thing the FCC does is take that paperwork without question and run it through their system issue call signs and everything like that. So there's another example of the government delegating regulatory capability to the people who are being regulated, in other words, us. And so far, I think there have been very few hiccups in the national, um, let's see, the Volunteer Examiner Committee system. Uh, there was one in Puerto Rico a while back where some people lost their licenses for basically giving open book tests. Um, but Otherwise, it's worked out very well. So there is a um, precedent for that in the, uh, I don't even know where I put it. There it is. The FCC giving the companies the ability to go to an independent third party who will test their equipment. They have to pay for these tests. But then they will certify to the FAA that the tests have been done and passed. Now, I, I take every one of these little radios that I get, and I put them on the spectrum analyzer, and most of the time they fail. So, obviously, something's a little bit wrong. Okay, let's see. Um... Cornbread, KO5RN. Dave, who would you buy coax from and what kind for over 100 feet and used on RF, VHF, UHF with about 1,200 watts max handling? Well, if you want one type of coax, I'd go with LMR400. But you need to remember that the proper connectors for LMR400 are made by Times Microwave. They are about $25 a piece, and there's a special tool set required to put them on. Now, you can put crimp connectors on them. I have done so and found it extremely difficult. So the other is RG213. I'd buy Belden cable. Um, you can get that cable from Ham Radio Outlet. You can get any kind of cable from ham radio outlet, make sure you're getting what you want. You can also go to DX Engineering. Now they have their own branded cable that they claim is equivalent. I don't know. I'm going to just look up here a brand uh, ABR Industries. Okay, here we go again with the screen. ABR Industries um, women owned business. Okay. Just a moment while I get this up here so I can, oops, pull this up. Okay, now we're going to go back to amateur radio coax. You can get amateur radio coax from these people also and this is a fairly good uh, coax maker there are lots of different coax makers don't buy something off amazon or ebay don't buy used cable 
I get new cable. My favorite cable for general purpose is RG8X. Now, um, the thing about uh, RG8X is that uh, it's good for HF. Uh, you can actually pump quite a bit of power, five or 600 watts. You're talking about 1200 watts. You wanna go to uh, either RG8U, which I, I wouldn't, it's a really old kind of cable. RG213 is very nice and very easy to work with. It's very flexible, and yet it is the thick stuff. ABR400 is, no, LMR400 is actually available in um, many different types. Some flexible, some not. Your standard classic um, cable, LMR400 cable, is uh, pretty stiff. So anyway, it will handle full Eagle Power Plus and it has fairly low attenuation at VHF and UHF for common coaxial cables. LMR 400, I will grant you, is rather expensive. Okay. Pull this down here, okay. So, um, Maybe what you could do is just call DX Engineering. I happen to like DX Engineering. And talk to them about what you want. And they will recommend uh, something for you. You can get cable with um, the ends already put on. In other words, you can have cable built to order. Um, one thing I will warn you is don't ever assume that you know how long a piece of cable you need because you can basically take the length from where you are to where it needs to be and multiply by like three to get there because like in, in my case my cable goes off the back up through a switch anyway down onto the floor under the treadmill down under the house out and under the deck then down to where the lightning arrestor is, and then from there it goes out to the antenna. And coax does not take a straight line, and so you're gonna need more of it than you think you will. If you're going to get the, the usually you can pre-buy coax at 50, 100 foot, 150 foot, 200 foot, whatever you want with the connectors on. I use PL259 and SO239. Those are commonly called UHF connectors, even though the UHF that they use has nothing to do with UHF, the frequencies. Okay, just historical military things. Um, there are people who swear by different types of connectors, but I use that, and that's pretty universal in the United States. Now, if you're doing a lot of QRP, you will be using uh, BNC connectors, um, which are easy to put on and off, but I have never successfully built one. Um, so I've done many, many, many hundreds of PL259s and uh, they work fine. And I generally do crimp connectors nowadays, uh, but you can still do the solder type. The problem with the solder is that the braid around it, you've got four little holes in the PL259. To If I actually knew where anything is, I'd be dangerous. Okay, these are your standard solder on connectors. And I've got this whole box full of coax connectors. 
here's your standard this is for RG8X and it's made of three parts there's an adapter ring right here because the connector itself is made for the RG213 size cable. Let me see if I can get that to force the focus on there. It doesn't want to. <laughs> oh well. Um, so this has got two parts on it. And this middle part here, which I'm trying to get out. I suppose if I slowed down I could go faster. Okay. Now, do you see those little holes right there? Right around here. The outer shield of the cable comes up and is visible in those holes. There's four of them. Okay, and the idea is that there should be strands from the outer shield of the cable visible in all four. And then your goal is to get in there and solder that exposed um, cable sheath to the connector. That can be very difficult because you have to get down in there. It has to be hot enough to actually heat this up to the point where it will accept solder. A little flux helps. Uh, and yet not hot enough to melt the insulation on the cable and then this is soldered. You push the uh, center conductor up through here at the top and solder it right there. And then, you haven't forgotten, of course, um, you've got to put this thing into. Anyway, it's a lot of work. Now, the crimp connectors, um, the crimp connectors, which you can see here, you crimp the outer shield gives you a much better chance of hitting the outer shield. Um, but then, let me just get this taken care of so that I don't dump it all over the floor. It's my entire collection of coaxial cable pieces. Um, so it's usually easier to do the crimp. Now, you need to buy some crimp tools to do that. Um, let me see if the company that I use for that is still in business. This is my coax crimping set. So here are the all the different tools that you need to crimp uh, the connectors on the coax. And it's from Quicksilver Radio, QSRadio.com. So let's just take a look and make sure that they still exist. So we'll go over here to screen to QS. Yes, radio. Um, and they sure do. Quicksilver radio. Okay, so they've got all kinds of stuff. Here's their coax connector and crimp kits. Um, okay. Um, what have they got here? I guess I must be using too much of the internet. Waiting for PayPal. Why are we waiting for PayPal? Okay. Anyway, they've got um, all the different kinds of things that uh, you could want. Coax adapters, the different types of things here. And we'll just go in and look at the uh, crimp sets. Oh, they do power pole uh, connectors. We've got all your different types of connectors and adapters and tools and supplies. Uh, 
Okay, here is the kit that I had, the ultimate. And then there's a super pack. It's got a little more. They both look, oh, it's got some extra stuff over here. Okay, and by the way, this crimp, master crimp tool that they have in here, this one, the, um, down here here is the crimp tool for those things okay and now you can change the jaws to do different things and one of the set of jaws that it comes with is for Anderson power pole connectors so you can use that same tool with that which is very handy I've done that many a time okay um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea about the coax. Um, the 1200 Shane KE5GSS from Texas. Bill Heiser KO6BLI, new here. Though I've watched many of your videos. Welcome. Nice to have you here. We do this every week. What we try to do on Thursday nights is just visit with each other and see how things were going. I think... A little later we might try, I'll put out a call on 40 meters and see if anybody can hear me. Uh, Blackham Radio University, Brother Dave, how have you been? I was a guest on one of their shows. Uh, Glenn, Glenn Martin, um, Glacial, oh, cold there, okay. Harry Rundle, hi Dave, fellow Augies from Harry, AC3EK in Overly, Maryland, temps dropping. Now 38 with 82% humidity. Yeah, it's been quite an interesting winter. Um, Neil Marsh with my fat fingers and aging eyes. I can't imagine programming a radio from my phone instead of my computer. Well, they tell you, after they tell you you can do this with your phone, that it's easier to do it on a website that they offer and then that will transfer it to the app on your phone. And I did show that that worked. And then the phone will program the uh, radio. So that means you can do maintenance on the phone if you need to change one thing or something like that or add one new repeater or something like that. Okay. Leo said, far out, Dave, never knew that the FCC had product lab information. It's all there, and it's all public. And beware that the FCC, they warn of this, they've not virus-checked any of it. Okay, they just put it up as they get it. Oakland Hall, uh, hello, Dave. Really enjoy your live streams and videos. Thank you for sharing them. Uh, N-Fed long wires mounted north-south radiate the signal in an east-west direction. Technically, if you're talking about a, a technical long wire, it's two to three wavelengths long. So at lower frequencies, these can become enormously long. And so uh, by long wire, I'm not just talking about random wire, but a true long wire is two to three wavelengths long and will be directional in the direction of the wire. And it's not a classic dipole, it's what's called a wave antenna. Okay, it's the same kind of antenna as the open V and the rhombic, all of which are wave antennas, and all of which are enormous, absolutely enormous. So, now, a, a random wire in the sense of a piece of wire, okay, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like an N-fed dipole kind of thing. Um, now, you, you bring up a fundamental question, and the easiest answer for that is directionality in an antenna is um, reciprocal. If it transmits in a certain direction best, then that's the direction it receives best, okay? That is a piece of reciprocity 
Uh, reciprocity does not apply to the ionosphere, contrary to what we like to think, but it does apply to the directionality of antennas. Okay. Um, and NFED long wire can do both transmit and receive equally well. It can. Okay. I mean, you get up in the air a little bit because the super classic long wire antenna is the beverage. The beverage is several wavelengths long, but it's only about 8 to 10 feet above the ground. It's a lousy antenna. Highly directional. Um, lousy antenna. But the thing is that it tends to reduce noise more than it reduces the signal. So it's a quiet antenna. So if you're prepared to put the necessary amplification in on receive, it can be a great receive antenna. Terrible transmit antenna. And there's not, not much you can do about that. You need a separate transmit antenna. Now, is that antenna still reciprocal? Absolutely, it is. It's a really crummy transmit antenna and a really crummy receive antenna. However, it receives signal much better than it receives noise. So it becomes the only practical, really good antenna for like 160 meters, something like that. Okay, Lee, KI5YPR, FCC works the same way. Big companies have set their own compliance labs, but all that I have seen have been honest because they do not want an FCC fine. And yes, the same thing works with Boeing. Um, they're, and they're going to get hammered by the, the FAA because of the problems with their airplanes. Um, so the people who work for Boeing but do the inspections are aware that they've got two masters to please. So, um, yeah, it's going to get kind of iffy there for a while. Now, Boeing is the last major commercial airplane manufacturer in the United States. And the government will not allow it to fail. It will take it out and flog the living daylights out of it, but it will not allow it to fail because then the country that invented aviation will no longer be making commercial airplanes. Now, McDonnell Douglas has merged with Boeing. So McDonnell Douglas was the big competitor uh, for Boeing before, not anymore. Uh, Lockheed Martin got out of the commercial airline business with the L-1011 because the engines were two years late and by then the market had moved on. Um, and, you know, some of the old things that have gone on. Lockheed makes the fighter jets, but so does Boeing. So does General Dynamics and a, a few other people make, make stuff for the military. Um, building commercial jets is a low margin business uh, because they've got so many airlines. It's, it's a weird business. There's a name for this in economics that I do not remember right now, where there's one supplier and many customers. Normally, we would call that a monopoly. But there is a major overseas supplier, and that's Airbus. And Airbus has come up with some really fantastic airplanes. And Boeing and Airbus compete head-to-head. -head. Now, Alaskan Airlines has gone all Boeing. Now, by making that statement, they're somewhat beholden to Boeing. You've got one manufacturer, one customer. Now, there's another type of things the other way around, the way the Defense Department works. You have many different suppliers and one customer. So the customer has tremendous hold over the suppliers. I was in that business for quite a while. Okay, man, and I thought at the time, 1980s, that our Liberty plane from NAS would be the last of its type was dodgy. Yeah, um, chat is working, but the feed is stalled. Um, hmm. 
I'm getting indications that I've got an excellent connection. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm running a 6876 kilobits per second right now, uplink, on our local ISP. The, these these uh, live feeds just don't work with uh, um, with uh, with um, Starlink. Starlink doesn't work. Okay, they're great on downlinks. Okay. Let's see, chat, working, Gordon West Books teaches answer memorization. Your new co-worker has an educational outlook that's 180 out of phase. That collaboration will be interesting to see. Yes, it will. I'm very interested to see how that works. Uh, the ARRL has some prepackaged uh, charts that they give to people so they can teach the, the one-day wonder tech classes. Um, I've seen those charts. I've even participated in teaching that material. Um, I don't like it. I like uh, a person who's learning to become a ham, learn to become a ham. Now, there is a school of thought to get them their license, and then they'll become a ham once they get on the air. However, the success rate for that approach is very low. The number of people who get their license and then disappear is very high, well over 50%, probably over 75%. Uh, so I want to teach a little bit more so that at least, um, oh, and the other thing I'm really pushy on is that uh, new hams need to find other hams. They need to socialize with other hams. They need to be around other hams. They need to take tips from other hams, recognizing that you ask five hams the same question, you're going to get six answers. So uh, anyway, I've put up over a thousand videos that I hope help people uh, become uh, hams who enjoy their time on the air. Okay, let's see. Um, Neil Marsh, reading for me, Leo, least with as rattling as it was, we didn't lose any hatches, yes. David C. 502, with Airbus and Boeing being the only two, manuf two major manufacturers of jumbo jets, is that considered a duopoly? Um, does the lack of competition affect quality? Um, what we are seeing so far, I mean, I've showed you the FAR before federal air regulations. They say that every one of them is written in blood. There's been some sort of an accident where somebody's lost their life. And so it ends up in an adjustment to the regulations. The quality is very high. It really is uh, because the menu, the um, airlines themselves do their own maintenance and they're very careful about how to do that. Um, I guess it would be a duopoly, except now we've got U.S. versus Europe because the uh, Airbus is a European, a pan-European type of thing, primarily France and Britain. And there was some concern about that when Britain left the EU because the Airbus is very much an EU creation. Um, DK5 ONV from southwestern Germany says, Happy Thursday evening from southwest Germany and happy uh, to you too. Neil Marsh said he had to change browsers. Um, DK5 ONV, I still have. RG213 UBX made in Germany, which I rarely use on portable operation. It's too heavy to have it carried around. Yeah, a lot of people go with the RG8X. Uh, I don't really like RG58 because the shield on it is not 100% shield. It's like 80% shield. And although that's still good, I just like the RG8X better because it's 100% shield. 
DK 50 and V for base operations RG 213 is still doing a great job even for US standards of 1500 watts peak envelope power yeah life and death Dave for 20 bucks you can buy 100 meters of fiberglass survey tape on a reel and actually measure those nasty long runs that's a that's a good idea Leo uh, Gustafson says a stellar in performance which uh, yeah okay thank you life and death says I would make the coax two pieces allowing you to disconnect and ground or surge protect just outside the shack uh, I bring all my cables in from all my antennas to a lightning arrestor attach the ground rod now it'll be going into that new locker thing and be grounded there so and I had them run a new ground rod so it was right beneath it and so they put the new ground rod in too um, now I, I was going to mention if you have the coax with the ends the connectors pre-mounted you've got a problem with holes you can take RG8X, drill like a quarter inch hole through something, thread the RG8X through there. It gets it out through the wall and no mice can come in. However, if you have to drill it big enough to put the cable, uh, the connector through the hole, then you're going to have to do something to backfill that hole because mice can come in. Uh, mice can come in through a hole about the size of a dime that's a dime right there mice can get through a hole that big and that is really tiny ask me how i know let's see um dennis cornell hi dave from fairbanks alaska 26 above zero real heat wave yeah kl7 hro nice to have you here this evening eric sund hello dave from minnesota n0 ezx Greetings from Alvarado, Texas. I enjoy your streaming and valuable information from Dan KC6 ZWM. John F. Any problem anticipated running feed cable and solar power through the same opening in my wall? Um, this is going to depend on your solar system. Normally, if you run coaxial cable, what's outside will not affect what's inside the cable that is not true with open wire line but if it's coaxial cable yes you can run everything together some of the solar systems these days put out a fair amount of hash i was quite interested yesterday my wife was using the treadmill while i had uh, the screen full of spectrum stuff and i noticed that the treadmill put an awful lot of hash out and was actually affecting my signal okay so yeah you can run them through leo says those kinds of crimpers are great for custom spark plug wires there you are michael gord clamp sometimes referred to as compression connectors for pl259 much easier to install than the braid soldering with the reducer and do not need to be crimped yes um well i've i use the the crimp there are lots of different ways to do it michael gord said similar to n and bnc non-crimp varieties and that's from southern highlands new south wales in vk2 bmg exploding turtle what is your opinion on testing for the tech in general on the same day I know a lot of people like to do that because the tests are actually quite similar. Um, I have no objection to you go from zero to general in the same day because when you do that, I'd stop at general, get an HF station put up, get on the air, and spend two years getting to know HF really well, contesting, DXing, uh, Brag, chewing, whatever it may be, getting to know which bands do what, and so on and so forth. And then after two years, then go for your extra. 
because it will mean so much more to you when you do that. Now, the track record for people who go from zero to extra in one sitting is not good. Because a lot of those people who do that are great test takers. And they can memorize material, pass the test, and then they're not sure what they have. That's like a pilot taking the written exam that does not qualify them to fly an airplane. You've got to go get somebody to give you flight instruction in addition to the ground school. I mean, you've got to get in the air and play with it. Now, I had a guy who said he, he got up to general without really learning anything. He, he felt like he was a license holder more than a ham. And I said, he said, what do I do to get back up to speed? And I said, get on the air. Get around other hands. You'll learn far more by doing that than you will by sitting there and reading a sterile book. Now, you can read all the books you want, and they'll be helpful, but do get on the air. Okay, so Bill, hello, Dave and all Augies from KA8GIM. 3 Henry 21, it's... Did that in May general? If you're taking the practice test and consistent pass in the 80, go for it. Yeah. A life and death, uh, pass general, 25 minutes after pass tech. Can't really lose by sitting for it if you studied. He says, I'm studying for tech now. I'll fold general in. I have a few weeks before the next local testing day. Dave Nolan. Hi, Dave again. Dave, I remember seeing you chat with Gordon West at the Rocky Mountain Hamvention in Keystone, Colorado, several years ago. I think it might have been the first time you and Gordo met. It might be. That was quite a while ago. Harry Rundle, Dave, we recently had about three inches of snow, which covered the ground radials of my vertical. I noticed an increase in performance on bands 40 to 10. How can I model this with antenna modeling software? I don't know. And uh, I, I answered an email question from somebody just today and said that uh, the uh, Easy NEC and the other modeling programs are built around a piece of software that was originally written in Fortran and now exists as compiled Fortran called the National Electromagnetic Code number two. And it was written under contract at uh, Berkeley Labs, Lawrence Livermore, um, quite a number of years ago. And since the government paid for it, uh, it's public, free to the public. Now, they did that again with NEC4. But Berkeley put in some of its own money. And so, therefore, they have the right to sell it. Now, from their point of view, it's not expensive. It's about 350 bucks, 400 bucks, something like that, for a license. Um, and well-to-do hams will do that. But it does many more things. One of the things that it does is consider the ground topography. And you see, two doesn't do that. Very few hams use NEC4 because not only do you have to pay or somehow get the wrapper, the gooey wrapper around it, but you have to um, uh, pay for the extra license. So it's much more expensive. Easy NEC works with NEC2. Now, there's a version of it that works with NEC4, and even though the guy who made all of that uh, Llewellyn uh, has uh, made it all free now. It's not being maintained anymore. Uh, the problem is that you still have to get that NEC4 license. Now, NEC2 assumes certain things about ground. One, it's level. Two, you can specify a very tiny number of parameters about the ground. Uh, basically, um, perfect ground, which is useless. Nobody has perfect ground unless you're transmitting and being surrounded by salt water. Um, normal ground, whatever that is, 
And then there's, I think, maybe a couple other kinds of ground that you can put in there. And so uh, the water, now the water of the snow is not very conductive to electricity. But um, it's interesting, you got the increase in performance. Um, you never drill a hole for the connector. That's what the bulkhead fittings are for. Good point. Robert Brown, this is KF0ODY. Hi. Optical Man Jeff has added $15 to the chat revenue. Thank you very much. This, this live stream, the live streams, are a major source of my Google income. And I really appreciate uh, you doing that. Um, and so if you would like to support the channel, you can do it that way. You can do it via Patreon. You can do it on PayPal with a subscription. Uh, you can just go to a tip jar that I have on Patreon for one time, whatever, put in whatever amount you want, in multiples of $1. Um, and this really helps keep the, keep the channel going, help me pay for my assistant and uh, the electrician who came today, uh, that was $400. I mean, you can't even get him to sneeze for less than that. And this was a very simple job, but it was beyond what I could do myself. Okay, Optical Man Jeff for his $15 points out, thanks Dave for all the great information and all your work you do for all of us hams. Okay, the... Um, uh, Leo said, my text was interrupted, but I was trying to relate that the only failing of my buddy pole hex beam was the BNC coax connector at the bottom would cam out. That's not good. <laughs> um, okay, Exploding Turtle has found his local ham club and will be going to the next meeting to introduce himself. Very good. Um, yeah, make friends with people there. Um, now, you may need to do some club chopping. They're all different kinds of clubs. And uh, my club is a bit of a bit ossified. Um, there really isn't a younger group like there would be at, at one of the other clubs, but uh, it's a good thing to do. So I changed it for a PL type connector and all has been well since. Otherwise that buddy pole performance is stellar. The hex beam is a nice antenna. A lot of people make it. Chris K0BLU. Hello from St. Cloud, Minnesota, where it's 23. Clear and a good time to work in bands. Yes, it is. Just out of curiosity, let me look over here. Move this junk out of the way. By the way, I was testing the alpha antennas, uh, HF portable antenna, and it fell over in the wind, and you can see here the crack that went all the way around, or about halfway around these cracks, and they, it cracked when it fell over. Now this is 3D printed, and notice that all the cracks are basically following the laminations in the 3D printing. Now I've taken this apart to see what's going on inside. It's a very thick, about three eighths of an inch thick uh, plastic all the way around. So the top comes off. What I'm going to do, these are just screws to hold the top on. I'm gonna take those off and I'm gonna use the drill press so I drill straight and I'm going to drill straight down all the way through and put like number eight hardware all the way through coming out the bottom with a nut on it. So that will keep this thing together. It's a shame that it cracked like that. It just, we had a gust of wind and it fell over. So anyway, I'll, I'll put that all in the, um, let's see, turn up the volume.
Oh, I know what that's from. Is this frequency in use? Is this frequency in use? KE0OG. I need to turn down No, it won't do it. Functions. Money. I need to turn money off. Okay. And I want the audio there. Okay. Now it won't do that. So if any of you would like, let's just try something right now. Um and go to 7210 7210 and let's see what happens i'm curious never tried this before on a live stream day clock might as well 7210 is this frequency in use this is kilo echo zero oscar golf in the middle of a non-monetized a live stream does anybody hear me on 7210 go ahead the band is starting to close up and we're at the start of a solar storm so i'll put that down here 7210 um kilohertz um lower side band yeah, I'm using a uh, step IR, uh, big IR, with the vertical. This is KE0OG uh, calling a little bit of a net to go along with the uh, Thursday evening live uh, stream. Is there anyone from that group who copies and wants to come back? The Alpha Sierra station bleep, please. Hi, Reed in Western Virginia. How are you? Could you give me your call again? I did not get the suffix. Sure thing, it's Alpha Bravo 8, Alpha Sierra, A-B-H-A-S, or... Okay, Reed, very nice to uh, meet you this evening. Are you on my live stream, too, uh, or uh, you just heard me calling? good and this is pretty good well I guess about normal for 40 meters this time of the evening very nice to meet you and so you can see you're in West Virginia so I've got to put that down here and I'm kind of curious if you want a QSL card Okay, 891 with an inverted V on 40, very nice. I'm running the ICOM 7300 uh, with um, a vertical. It's just a vertical, a ground-mounted vertical with lots of radials. And uh, 100 watts seems to be going okay. So very nice to hear from you. And thank you. Yours head is there. Anyone else out there? This is KE0OG. Yes, KE0OG. This is Kilo 7, Lima Zulu, Kilowatt 7, Lima Zulu, Zulu. Kilowatt 7, Lima Zulu, Zulu. Let me just jot the time down here. 
and uh, you're a nice five nine here in uh, Colorado and uh, please uh, give me your name and location Oh, it helps if I get the mic turned in the right direction. KL7ZZ, um, in the KE0OG, fine business on the RV park. Um, we've got some relatives in Whitman, which is, you're probably at Wittenberg, or I think that's how it's pronounced, something like that, if you're uh, northwest of uh, Phoenix. Is that any anywhere near Congress? Okay, very good. Well, I'm going to say 73 to you and see if anybody else from the live stream would like to jump in. And you have a great day. KL7LZZ is KE0OG. QRZ, this is KE0OG. Kilo Echo 8 Mike something. Come again? Yeah, this is Kilo Echo 8 Mike Echo Pop Pop. This is Phil from Ohio. Well, hello, Phil. And uh, I think you're optimally positioned to go to the Dayton uh, Hamvention. Um, I did not go this last year, and I missed it. I would like very much to go again. So, um, very good to talk with you this evening. I'm running a vertical. What kind of equipment do you have there? Go ahead. Yeah, Dave. Uh, I've got an SC950 uh, bumper up to the rear watch when I heard your call. Um, running into an inverted speed fan cycle. Uh, currently a 20 and 40 meter element only. Um, that's what I've got to work with at the moment. And I just wanted to say uh, a lot of your YouTube videos are Well, I appreciate that, Phil, very much. I looked at the FT950 some years ago, but uh, didn't didn't go with it. I eventually went with the Yaesu FT-DX3000, which is a very nice radio. But when I rejiggered the station here to create a reference station for a new general, I went to the ICOM 7300, it's a good uh, starter radio that can uh, keep it going for a long time. So, what's the weather like in Ohio there? Are you getting uh, some cold weather there? It's a little chilly this evening, not too bad. Uh, this afternoon, we, uh, I think we get about 50 degrees, uh, cool enough since the sun has gone down. A little bit of snow to the south of us. Uh, I'm not sure uh, where the logging software that you use is showing me. I was in the Cincinnati area previously and had made it to uh, the inventions that were um, events, uh, so the COVID years, obviously, I didn't make it down there, but uh, currently in Northeast Ohio, 
Oh, we've got some great weather right now. It's 37, still above freezing. We had a beautiful day yesterday. Oh, it was gorgeous sun shone all day. Today it was back and forth. Well, Phil, I'm going to let you go and say 73. See if I've got anybody else who is coming in from the live stream. I'm doing a live stream at the same time here. And um, it's a the uh, live streams via YouTube. And it is definitely not monetized. So I'm not making money from this particular conversation. So, very good to talk to you, Phil. KE8MEP73 from KE0OG. Okay, 73s. And I think I heard a very loud call from uh, Kilowatt Delta 7, Alpha X-Ray Foxtrot, and we're at 06 right now, time after 03. And uh, let's see, KD7AXF, KE0OG, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dave. And the call sign is KD7 Alpha X-Ray Foxtrot. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, my name is Gary. I definitely want to thank you for the videos. I'm really looking forward to taking my extra test here in a, in a month and a half. And I also have a inverted V about 30 feet up. And I'm running a, 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 oh gee, um, Yesu FTDX10. Back to you, uh, Dave. Um, uh, OG, I forgot the first part. <laughs> uh, it's KE0 OG, and uh, so your KD7 AXF, fine business on the FTDX10. I'm kind of curious how you like that rig. Tell me about it. I really enjoy it a lot, and uh, it is also my first HF radio. I got it in July, and... Um, I've got a, a group that I talk to just about every night on 7208, so I really enjoy the radio. It's a great radio. I also have a HLA305 300-watt uh, amplifier hooked into it. Oh, very good there. Um, did I get your name? I don't see it here. Tell me your name. Oh, Gary. Gary. There it is, Gary. Uh, fine business on the amplifier. You're doing a good job here. And your signal sounds great. Definite 5.9 plus. And so I'm going to say 73 and see if there's anybody else from the live stream um, before we run out of time. So I'll say 73 to you. KD7AXF. Here is KE0OG73. KE0OG QRZ. Uh, seven whiskey Oscar Oscar. Come again. Whiskey seven whiskey Oscar Oscar. Portable seven in Utah. Well, very good. Um, name here is Dave. Well, you know that. Um, and I assume you're one of the people on the live stream. We're just doing a, a little bit of a net on the live stream. A number of people have asked for it. And so far it seems to be going great. Uh, tell me your name and where you are in Utah. Utah, very southwestern part of Utah. Name is Leo, Lima, Echo, Oscar. Home station is in eastern Nevada. Well, very good. Um, I have a sister in Las Vegas, and I've got sisters up in the Salt Lake area, too. And one down in California, four of them. So, um, and your name's Leo. Okay, I'm Dave. And uh, what are you running there, uh, Leo? Go ahead. I'm running an old rig. It's uh, an ICOM 720. It's, uh, it is solid state. I think it was the first solid state transceiver uh, made for commercial use. It's about 50 years old. Uh, but I have been a ham longer than that. 
Oh, well, very good. And your ICOM is sounding great. The audio is fine. You've got a nice 5.9 signal in here. And I've been through St. George many times and stopped at the visitor center there. And uh, I guess they're doing some major revisions on the temple there. And uh, so nice to make your acquaintance. So I'm going to say 73 and, and get one last QSO before we close the uh, close up the live stream here. W7WOO. Woo. And uh, I guess that's what you did with your wife. So W7WOO, here is KE0OG73. Hey, 73, Dave. Thank you. The pleasure was on this end. Oh, very good. Thank you. Uh, this is KE0OG, QRZ. NG0Z, I think it was. Uh, go ahead. This is uh, John in Minnesota, and uh, it is an honor to make a contact with you because I watch your uh, channel on YouTube. Oh, very good. I hope you find it useful. Um, I work really hard on it, and uh, sometimes I think uh, I should spend a little bit more time on each video. So instead of three a week, two a week, or something like that. Uh, I hope you found them useful. Go ahead. Oh, for sure. No, for sure. I've been a ham. Just renewed my license for the first time. So I'm, I'm only 10 years into the deal. I'm uh, going to be 59 years old here in a couple weeks. So I'm kind of a late uh, a late starter to the hobby. But I have a uh, flex station in, in Minnesota that I operate uh, remotely from about two hours away. I'm in an HOA townhome down here in the city, so my station's up at the cabin. So I put about a kilowatt your way with a JKXR7 up about 75 feet. 100% remote these days. And uh, so I, 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 I've appreciated a lot of the ideas and help and, and things that you put on your channel. And, and uh, always, and I'm a subscriber, and, and uh, so I always know when you put something new out or. Oh, very good. Well, thank you. Um... For that information, um, I know another guy who uses a flex, so very happy with it. The fact that you're doing completely remote is uh, very good. You don't have to worry at all about that HOA, and you can go up there with the kilowatt and do that there in Minnesota. I imagine you get a, a bit of a winter. Um, anyway, uh, I'll turn it back to you for a final here. I'm going to say 73, and... Back to you, NG0Z, KE0OG. All right, David. Well, very nice to meet you, and thanks for all the work that you do. I don't know why you think you need to put more work into them, because they're very well produced and edited, and uh, they're just a great uh, work of art. And, uh, and, and again, I'm really uh, mostly appreciative of people that promote the hobby, because I think that's good for all of us to promote the hobby, get more people interested, pull more people into the hobby. It's good for the manufacturers, it's good for the hobby, it's good for the spectrum. I mean, so I really appreciate everything you do for the hobby. This is NG0Z, nice to meet you. I look forward to our next QSO, 73. Uh, 73, and I'm going to go QRT and finish up the live stream here. Thank you all who uh, came back to me. Uh, this is KE0OG, QRT. Well, we did it. We actually did it. Wow. Okay. Um, let's see. We got a few things uh, here. Um, the Hustler 6 BTV has good, a lot of good press on it. Um, let's see. Exploding Turtle, her and herself. Hmm. Harry Rundle, RS, I have the 6 BTV and it is fantastic. Okay, yeah, if they get the ground radio field. Uh, Wetman67 says, welcome to Augie Special. What frequency was uh, 7210? It just was an open one, the open one that I picked. Uh, Glenn Martin in 0QFT, thank you, Dave. Godspeed. Uh, oh, there it is, 7210. Let's see. Nothing heard in Wisconsin. Bill can hear me. Uh, Chuck Morris, Tipdar just completed. Thank you. Chuck in Clackamas, Oregon. I've been there. 
W7HDF. Chuck had good experience with ABR Industries. Bought a bunch of different adapters. Do very well. Okay, heard in Indiana. Please do it again. Can just pick you up, Dave, but my hex beam is pointed the wrong way. Okay, Chris Goodman. K. Um, uh, I can't read the call sign here. It says Metro Skywarn has an ice spotter field toolkit. Be safe, be well, be warm. And he's added $20 to the chat revenue. Leo Gustafsson has added uh, $10 to the chat revenue. And I can't get rid of this little pop up. There we go. And this is Leo's third super on a live stream. Uh, nice spotter field toolkit, Western Washington. Signal 7 in Oxnard, California. I've been there. Read AB8AS. He was one of the people we talked to. Um, let's see. Wow. Not even hearing the guy in Ohio. Uh, yeah, I... It's, it's funny how the propagation works. This is why we need to get experience on the air. 5-8 into Wisconsin. 3 Henry 21 added $20 to the chat revenue. This is great. Dave needs to be a regular event on the live stream. And this is your 10th Super Chat. And I appreciate that. Okay, well, we are out of time. We're actually over time. Okay, so we've broken the ice. We actually picked a frequency and did about a 20-minute uh, little thing on the air and had a chance to talk to several people. Gary, Phil, Gary, um, Leo, and John. Very good. So thank you all very, very much. And um, we'll see you this coming Thursday. I'll set up the, the live stream for it right now. And we'll see you then. Until then, 73.